We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and really the only thing that we need to talk about is that Lando has won a Formula One race. That's really all we need to talk about. It's Lando's world, and we're just graced with his presence, so... Um, yeah, that, that's about really it. Damn time. Okay, right. end the podcast. So... <laughs> yep, twenty one seconds. That's all. That, usually done. our podcasts are what fifty minutes long. Twenty one seconds. All you need normally, to know. Lando Norris won a race. Normally you can't shut us up, but here we are with you know <laughs> nothing to talk about besides Lando. So. Yeah, I mean it was it was you know hard you know coming up with like how are we supposed to structure this when the biggest part of the weekend is just Lando Norris I mean he had a wild weekend if you if you really think about it you know you know he he qualified well sprint was bad didn't qualify well for the Grand Prix and then all of a sudden he won I mean he qualified fifth that's not horrible it, it it wasn't where they they really intended considering the upgrades that were on the car and the and the fact that like can, let's talk about the the Q three for for the Grand Prix. So because we're just gonna get into this. Session. We're not even gonna like have a nice greeting of like how was your weekend. We're just going right into it. Well, well, yeah. Hi, how was your weekend? I'm at my best friend's mom's house, and that's why I'm not podcasting from my desk. Your your home, um, in Argentina, Lando Norris won a race. <laughs> Okay, well, I was going to, you know, touch on how I didn't hate the sprint weekend, but I'd much rather right, talk though? about Lando. At, okay, so where are we going, Catherine? <laughs> Which well, let's, let's, let's start with that first, that, that Q3 session for the Grand okay. Prix after the sprint race, and then we'll talk about the sprint. But I, I okay. really, like, that was one of the, not one of the weirdest qualifying sessions I've ever seen, but, like, come on. The fact that nobody had a great, flying lap on their last attempt like that was ridiculous I would say it's one of the more disappointing qualifying sessions that we've ever seen right I would say not ever but in recent time yeah it, it, it wasn't it wasn't great um it was just it was it was weird and like nobody was getting a hail and I think part of it is like the Miami track track configuration is not great. So no. Like there there's there's something to be said for having a track with long straights, but having a track with the straight as long as the track that we have in Miami is just really takes away from some of the racing. And like just like they need to like throw in a chicane on that, you know, back portion yeah. where you just drive straight for a mile. Yeah, I don't love the track either, but honestly <sighs> I hate to say this, it was more exciting of a weekend than I thought it would be, which I guess is good. Yeah. But like, I, I don't know. I think just because Miami was so cringe last season, really? I just like can't get over how much I don't like Miami. I also, we're going to he- like really take a sidebar and caveat this. I hate Miami because it's full of influencer events who like don't even care about the, the Grand Prix and it's so dumb, and there's so much hoopla that doesn't need to be there, and that is my gripe towards Miami. It's like right. if you look on Instagram this weekend, someone that you follow as a who is an influencer or whatever is at the GP in Miami, just like with a brand or with an event, and they don't pay attention, they don't know what's going on, and they're like, "Ooh, look at me, I look cute," and it's like it just takes away from the sport. That is my soapbox for the day. I will step down. Um, but no, overall it was good, especially, dare we, dare I say that I may not hate sprints this season? That's, that's where I am too. Cause like the problem with the sprints itself is that the sprints don't matter in the grand scheme of the weekend. That's the problem that we still have. We were fortunate this weekend to have two great races. Cause I said this in the, in the predictions episode and probably also in the China recap, the problem that we have with the sprint weekends is we have either an exciting sprint race and a really boring Grand Prix, or we have an exciting Grand Prix and a really boring sprint race. So they have made things better. Obviously we've had two really great sprint you know, races these past two, two weekends. Um, my, my friend, um, who I'm hanging out with this afternoon, he made a great point that, um, 
they shouldn't have made China a sprint and China should not have been a sprint. Well, no. But it worked out in, you know, better. And obviously, you know, everybody's like, well, what do we would you rather have FP2 or exciting racing? Um, but it, you know, it that I don't really think that that's the correct argument here because the sprint is still just another race. And as Fernando Alonso says, it's another opportunity to, you know, get damage or, you know, penalty points or, you know, penalties. Yeah. And we'll I mean, talk even about penalties later. the presenters on on Sky Sports um, were saying essentially Q1 is just another practice session. And like, if you know that your car has pace, you're not really taking it seriously. You're really just out there doing practice work because on sprint weekends, you only have so much time on the track. Right. Which takes away from qualifying for the Grand Prix. Right. And you know, it, you know, we we didn't really see anybody that we didn't expect to see in the bottom five other than probably maybe Daniel um, just because of yeah. how he had performed in the sprint. Um, but I just, the, the going straight from sprint to Grand Prix qualifying, I still have an issue with it. I do too. I will say though, I will say it was a more exciting and entertaining weekend because we had so much going on every single day versus having three free practices where it's like great we can watch but it doesn't mean anything right and really we just have qualifying and and the race this did provide more entertainment which at the end of the day this is a business and they want people to tune in and watch for and be entertained because it is an entertainment product so I get that have they made it more entertaining and and sprint weekends more enjoyable to watch I think so but I still don't love that they don't mean anything yeah I agree all right should we talk about the sprint a little bit mostly I just want to talk um, about David Ricardo that's all yeah. I want to talk about like I don't I couldn't yeah oh my god he like anything else that happened I, I couldn't tell you what happened in the sprint besides the fact that Danny got p4 beat Carlos and, and he beat Carlos and I was like oh my god Danny this is amazing I mean like you said he went on to really qualify poorly for the GP but he did really well in the sprint. And that's really all I want to touch on the sprint because I don't care about the sprints. Again, they mean nothing. Um, but Danny did so, so well. Yeah, he he really showed, you know, obviously he was on the back foot already coming into the Grand Prix with that three-place grid penalty from China that he probably shouldn't have gotten. But the fact that he was able to hold off Carlos Sainz in a Ferrari while driving not a Red Bull, but the V-Carb, was just fantastic. I know. I know. I'm I'm yeah. I was so happy to see him. He had such a big smile. You know, he's up there in the driver's standings now. Um so I'm very happy for him. Yeah, he finally has points. It, and it was it was a double points day for for V Carb cuz cuz Yuki scored scored as well. So it it was it was really it was really good. And then on the other side of the the sprint race, you have Kevin Magnussen playing human wrecking ball and ruiner of Lewis Hamilton's day, which as somebody who's not a great fan of Lewis Hamilton, I was okay with. It was it was entertaining even if it was as some people are saying a little bit on the line of sportsmanlike performance from Magnussen. Honestly, he was just driving, like, I wouldn't say, like, aggressively, but he was just, like, committed. That's what I'll say. Like, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Like, was he all over the place? Absolutely. But, you know, I think he was just driving hard, and and he was in there. I don't know. Well, well, we have to talk about Mags, K-Mags, for, like, I could go on about him for 20 minutes, but. um, Yeah. Yeah, and just penalties in general. But yeah, I think I think he's probably I, I haven't looked for for sure because I think that there we're still pending some some penalties. Um, but he might have like the Formula One record for penalty um seconds <laughs> for an entire weekend. I mean Esteban Agon might have done it past. I was gonna um, say Ezra Ma- Maldonado also, also might have done it, but this might actually beat Esteban, um, which is pretty hilarious and like part of it was you know he's been playing the team game with Nico Hulkenberg basically all season long um where if Hulkenberg's ahead he will do what he can to push you know the rest of the grid behind him back which he's very good at doing and then just adding another layer of you know really being aggressive about it you know trying to fend off Lewis yeah I mean I know K-Mags like isn't doing great personally this season but I would say he's been like the absolute number one teammate all season long 
because yeah, he has I mean, really he... defended and protected points for Hulk and like really 100%. been a team player. And I think even though this is like considered individual drivers, it is a team sport at the end of the day. And to see a driver who really just takes team orders and d- and, and excels at the ask, I think, you know, that really goes to show how, how good of a driver he really is. Yeah, and I think the only real mistake that he made was when he hit Logan Sargent. <laughs> Oops. Poor Logan, man. Home race. Ugh. Yeah, that I, was, I that was a real big thing for him this weekend. All right, before and we he, get too he, off track. Look at him in the sprint. I mean, to, to stay off track for a second, look at him in the sprint. <laughs> he finished P10. Of course, it doesn't matter because the points don't go that far, but this is his best finish all season. I know. I know. I was. It's just was in really a portion of the race that doesn't matter. I know. I know. I know. We we went off track and we returned on track without gaining position there. That's what we just did. So <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> All the metaphors. All right. Very so good. now let's put us back on track for real and talk about the race. Um Lando won. Yeah. Lando freaking won. I'm so excited. I started to get like, you know, goosebumps and chilies and I got, you know, just watching everyone congratulate him and having him swan dive like into the crowd. I loved it. It was, it really goes to show how, you know, loved he is on track by drivers and everybody else congratulating him, saying how great he was doing, seeing Alonzo come up to him, who was like, you know, kind of has worked in a pseudo, you know, mentor ish position for him being with McLaren for years and everything like that. Um, that was really cute to see, seeing Danny come up and give him a big hug and, and Carlos know, went all the way Carlos. out to the grid to congratulate him that yeah. they're the best of friends. Yeah. yeah I, I thought really that was cute. really great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that, you know, one thing that, that Adam and I were talking about and my dad also texted me about was that. I don't think there's ever been a point in the history of Formula One where the drivers on the grid have all actually been friends to the point that we are at now. Because you have the friendship between Carlos and Lando. You have the friendship between um, the 2019 rookie class with George and Alex. You have, you know, Lando's friendship with Max. You know, there, you know, obviously we have the Max and Lewis rivalry and the, you know, Alonzo Lewis rivalry and, you know, the animosity between Akon and Gasly and, you know, things like that. And you have the bromance between Sonoda and Gasly. So there's, I, I really don't know if there has ever been a point in the history of the sport where people have just been so happy for each other's success to, to the point that these drivers are, where even Max, who was not happy that he didn't win, was happy for Lando. Right. He said, if, you know, on a bad day, if you're getting sec- like second, I call it a good day, especially with Lando winning. Like, I'm so happy for him. So I think it's really cool. I also love how you're like, everyone's friends, except for this and this and this and this. <laughs> and this. <laughs> but no, it seems like everyone is more friendly than maybe in the past. And just everyone is, you know, building each other up, which is kind of, you know, always fun and cool to see. But um, but yeah, no, Lando finally got his first win after 110 so happy. races. I know. So happy. I'm sure his mom also just loved the fact that he won his first race and he has like this bandage from a drinking related incident. (laughs) Yeah, he, Adam said the same thing. He will always remember this race as being the weekend following. The other funny part is Lando got this injury celebrating a holiday in Max's home country. Yep. in the Netherlands. Um, and he will always remember that he had a remnant from King's Day on his nose while celebrating his first Formula One win. God bless him. God bless him. I love it. Yeah. Oh, man. So, okay, let's go through these records here for a second. So it was his first win in 110 races. And at the very beginning of the season, we said he, you know, was up there in number of races without a win. Um, so number of now, podiums without a win. Number of, thank you. Number of podiums without a win. So he has eclipsed that and it took him 110 races for his first win, which you might think is a long time. But if you think about like when he's been on track, it was in like Lewis's heyday and, uh, and then Max took over. So, you know, think of it that way. 110 is not bad. He's the first driver to have their maiden win in the U S since 1982. Um, so it's been a really long time since a uh, driver got their first win in the U.S. He's the 21st British driver to win, um, and he's also the 114th F1 race winner. So, lots of big things happening for Lando this weekend. I'm very happy for him. 
yeah, it was it was really exciting to to see that uh, we we heard "God Save the King" um, as the anthem this time. Which the last time we heard the British national anthem, it was "God Save the Queen." Uh, so it's yes. been a minute. Um, but yeah, it was it was really a long time coming, um, and just to you know have this finally happen for Lando, who is a driver that is on the grid with so much expectation for a world championship, um, and to finally you know see him get this win, especially after you know the likes of you know Russia. 2021, which is, you right. know, the, one of the greatest specters of his career in a race that he, you know, would have and probably should have won had they not decided to gamble on keeping him on slicks when it started raining. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, Lewis won a race again. So it, it really is, um, you know, long time coming. And, you know, even if you're not necessarily a Landon Norris or McLaren fan, you, everyone's happy for him. Right. Exactly. And something that really helped for Pelham was this huge upgrade package that McLaren oh, brought yeah. this weekend. So they upgraded, they brought 10 upgrades to Lando's car. And then Oscar Piastri had about half of them. I don't know which half he had, but they upgraded um, Piastri's car halfway. Lando had the full new package. And then in Imola, which is the next race, Oscar will have the full car. Um, they looked really fast and really good both drivers not just Lando Oscar was driving super super well until he had you know front wing damage from an incident with Carlos um but Oscar drove really really well um and if he only had half of the upgrades like I think next next race they'll they'll look really good of course Imola is the race where everyone brings upgrades so I feel like the the field might change a little bit but this weekend McLaren looked really really good yeah, the, those upgrades came on and and they worked. Um, Oscar, like you said, he I mean he he was doing really well and he also did well when they came back on um, after he had his front wing change. Which, as we record, it's only been you know a less than a little bit more than an hour after the race right. ended, um, and the stewards are investigating um, the incident between Carlos and Oscar. So there might yeah. be some you know fallout of that. If you know, you'll see that you know we'll talk about it on uh, the going off track. Instagram account is probably not going to matter much. And if it does, it'll just probably be to Carlos. Um, but, you know, Oscar did drive really well. Um, and also his pit stop time, t- it was 10 point something for a front wing change is actually kind of fast. So, so McLaren, you know, they, they, McLaren, we know, we know, knows what they're, what they're doing with their pit stops, even if it has to be one of the longer ones. And, you know, let's take us back a few races where we had, like, 27-second pit stops just for tire changes with Sauber. Um, and they changed yeah. the front wing in under 11 seconds, which is absolute insanity. So, yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Very yeah. good. I also was very entertained when um, Oscar was fighting Daniel for P16 uh, toward the end of the race. And um, McLaren got on the radio and told Oscar not to cause a safety car uh, yeah, because like, Lando was um, winning. Oscar, we would just like to remind you that Lando's currently leading the race and we're not looking for a safety car here. <laughs> Basically, that- cut the shit. <laughs> Drive safe. We, so we, this was probably one of the best weekends for radio calls oh, between by far. Max's reactions to, to qualifying in both the sprint and regular qualifying with the, wait, what happened? That was a bad lap. Why do I have pull? And then, you know, Carlos being really mad at Oscar when they were fighting. And then, you know, McLaren telling Oscar to not ruin this for Lando. Like it was top tier radio content. Oh, and then them like coming on at um carlos and he's like yeah okay i get it just leave me alone i was like oh someone's getting a little feisty (laughs) yeah yeah you you know that carlos is upset when he tells ricky to leave him alone oh good yeah (sighs) all right um max got p2 i don't there's nothing to say he got p2 i i think i think the one thing to say and this is is a credit to lando is that this is a race that lando won while max was still in the field which if you think about the number of races that have been won with you know with max still driving other than you know checo is singapore last year because you know this this year because australia won on dnf 
Yeah. yeah. So, so I think that that's, you know, you, you saw that Max did not have the pace to, to come after him. Max was, you know, struggling on those, those hard tires. And I think that Max probably did have at least a little bit of front wing damage from him when he ran over that bollard that caused mm-hmm. the first, you know, the virtual safety car to, you know, earlier on in the race, um, which actually worked out very well in Max's favor until Kevin Magnuson, who probably owes, you know, Lin, or Lando owes him a fruit basket for um, causing that safety car that put Lando in the position that he ended up being in. God, I know. Good old K-Mags. Um, but yeah, so also if you didn't watch the race, which I don't know why you'd be listening to the podcast if you didn't watch the race. However, um, Max just completely went over a curb and hit um, the cone and it was just like hanging in his car for a while before it finally like flew off. But he yeah. was watching it in the cool down room, watching it, and he was like, "Huh, yeah, that happened. Oh, that ex- that <laughs> that explains a lot. Uh, go figure." Yeah. yeah, and then and then of course you've got Charles Leclerc, who, oh yeah, by the way, he finished on the podium, but. He, what? He, honestly, he was a non-factor. I'm kind of annoyed with Ferrari for like not switching the Ferraris in the beginning because it looked like. Um, Charles was really losing grip on his tires and Carlos had more pace and they pretty much told him to hold. Um, but, you know, I'll always be frustrated with Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's so. a little bit debatable about whether or not they should have changed positions i think it might have been too early and then by the time you know right. later on in the race it was it was irrelevant because of you know how how the strategies have gone but yeah i i didn't i i didn't expect us to love it either and and not just because we prefer carlos over charles um but charles was just really kind of anonymous and i mean he did not have a good start at all um and he, no. he kind of got lucky because checo dive bombed you know half half of the front of the grid um Oops. Well, yeah, because if Checo didn't make that, like, if Checo didn't drive like an asshole, uh, Carlos would have been in front of Charles because he got off mm-hmm. way better than Charles did. Charles had a horrible Significantly. start. Horrible start. And um, Carlos came up in front of him, actually, but then Checo dive bombed and then he had to break. Um, and, you know, not to naturally. say that Checo dive bombed on purpose, he locked up, but it just, it was not, it was not, not the great. best smartest move no no but but speaking of of not the best smartest moves I think the longer that I watched throughout this weekend and the more I saw that Ferrari livery the matter it made me (laughs) Did, did you see like just thinking about it like how did a million people approve this design yeah I I just I you know, I, I sent a, a picture to you of the cars that Carlos and Charles actually drove to the track, which were blue. a pair of blue. They were blue Ferraris with some red accents. And I was like, why couldn't we have that on their car? Well, like the, the more I looked at it, the matter I got. And I have questions because the presenters from Sky Sports, I don't know if it was Martin or if it was Crofty, but one of them said that this is their North American livery. Meaning, like, it could potentially be for more than just this weekend. Oh, God, I hope not. Because this, is, this livery is just bad. I can't. Not only the livery, but the paraphernalia along with it. And if you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the entire team looking like gas station attendants working at Shell around the corner. Seeing yeah. Fred in that shirt, it's like, you know, Fred is a, has a nice little, little tummy. And he's wearing this shirt. He's balding, and if you didn't know who he was walking around, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that guy pumps my gas around the corner at the Shell station, and he probably has a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, and he's going to go scratch off a lottery ticket. Like, that's what it makes you look like. It is so bad. And not to mention, Charles Leclerc's helmet was the same powder blue, and he looked full Smurf. I said this before yes. that they were Smurfing out. When I saw the full getup with the blue shoes, the bl- the light blue suit, and the light blue helmet, full blown Smurf. Now Carlos looked a little better, not much, but he had the the like royal blue helmet versus the powder blue, so it was a mm-hmm. little bit better. But it was so bad, just all around. I don't know who's making these decisions. I mean, yeah. maybe they're drunk doing it. I don't know because that's the only way that I could see it being okay. 
It's so good. Yeah, I will I will say that the the mechanics in the suits that they were wearing, they were they had the navy navy blue and then they had um red and, and with navy blue accents on their helmet. They looked fine. Like if right. they if they did that and I, I understand like the history of the different kinds of blue and how they tie into the history of Ferrari, but it just it really didn't work. And they they really the executed it very poorly. We don't care about the history. We get it, we don't care. Make it look good. Bottom line. I mean, they could have they could have acknowledged the history of Ferrari in the United States with the red and the blue and have done it better. I mean, even if they turned the Ferrari car into like an actual American flag, that would have looked better than what we got this weekend. Well, don't try and take away this American glory from Logan Sargent with his I am Captain America everything he wears whenever he's in the U.S., especially Florida. But um, it was just so well. Bad. To 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 that point, Max's helmet and the um, the um, Red Bull team they they had a little bit of a nod to the American flag on their um, clothes, and I I I liked Max. The more I saw of Max's helmet, the more it grew on me. Um, and there were a bunch of different different helmets that had come out after we recorded um, the last episode. But the moral of the story is the ones that we talked about in the predictions episode are really the ones that we cared about the most, and every, all the other ones were just fine. Nico Hulkenberg had a good Miami helmet. No, I, I like really to need to to mention. I just want to ask this question, and it's just like a question to the universe here. Why do we all think we have to do like something with the American flag when it comes to the Amer- the U.S. races? It's like, okay, everyone, we're going like spa. We're going to spa. Do we do special everything for spa? No, but it's like we're in Florida. It's like, yes, yeah, stars and stripes. Let's go. You know what I mean? It's like I don't yeah. get it. Like I do. I mean, I do, but I just like I don't. And it's just like. I don't want to say this because I don't want this to come across as the wrong way. And I feel like it will, but I'm going to say it anyways. I feel like it's just like we give extreme NASCAR energy whenever we come to the U.S. races. I mean, I I can see that. And, you know, I also NASCAR is, you know, permanent left turn is is not necessarily my favorite. Um, The only NASCAR event I watch is that, you know, clash in the Coliseum, just because I don't understand how the clash in the Coliseum physically works, because there's not enough room in the LA Coliseum. Um, And I am very passionate about my lack of understanding of that. But but I do know what I mean. I do. I do understand what you mean. It's like flags, stars, stripes, red, white, blue, USA, America, eagles. And it's well, because like, like on a, you know on the grand scheme of like the the you know a national international landscape, what do what what else do, do people not in the United States know us as other than you know some things that we don't really need to to bring up in a sports podcast? Also, though, yeah, we're sticking to sports here. I will red flag you for that. Um, but no, like, how does the U.S. have three races? Like, that's what I want to know. That is like, it's well, that so I have a little bit less of a problem with that because geographically it does make more sense because if if you say why does the US have three races well why does Italy have two um and you know fair geographically it is easier for people who live in Europe to go to more different european races than it is for somebody in the united states to go to multiple races um you know because we have canada three us races mexico brazil mexico. and yeah, and, and and that's it. Unless you want to like you know fly all the way to Japan or to China, um, you know go you know fly the other the other way to go to you know to Europe. So so you know geographically think, it does make sense, right? But I think it's just for me I'm hung up. Like I love it. Don't get me wrong. Vegas at night is kind of annoying, but I you know digress. But I'm just saying like for a sport that is so so deep rooted and like. European fans and European everything it's just crazy that they are giving the U.S. three races like I totally get it we are a huge audience and we will throw money at any sporting event because that's how we roll here so I get it I get it it's just do I understand it yes do I not understand it yes also yes you know what I mean yeah (laughs) yeah yeah it's it's and and what it really also comes down to is the growth 
of the sport in the United States in recent right. years, because obviously we've had races in the United States. You know, we've had, um, you know, what happened in 2005 in Indianapolis, which we have an entire episode about and how that kind of damaged, you know, Formula One's reputation in the United States um, after that little cluster mess. We had had races in Phoenix that, you know, I don't understand how we raced here and I understand why we don't race here anymore because they race in downtown Phoenix and that's weird. Um, but it's, you know, it since Drive to Survive has massively exploded the popularity of Formula One in the United States, it makes sense that they want to put in money to bring in more Formula One into the United States oh, to then course. get more money out of Formula One. I know you know of that. Um, but I also understand where it's like, well, you know, Formula One is this weird European sport um, that obviously you and I haven't really, you know, had much concept of until, you know, the last three, four years. Three yeah. years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I, I like, I like to see it. I know I do too. And uh, honestly, I'm still like holding my breath and crossing all of my limbs that we get a street race in Chicago, but. Oh yes, please. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. So going on the, on the flip side of this, we absolutely hated Ferrari's livery. I hope to never see it again. Yes. Um, I freaking loved the carbs livery this weekend like for an mm-hmm. alternate livery I think it was a huge success I think every season these like one-off liveries are hit or miss and it's like oh well yeah it kind of missed the mark but I get I get it it's fine like non-factor and then every once in a while we get these one-offs that are like "Ooh, I almost like this better than their original livery but in our livery episode we both said that V-Carb was our favorite and it was so good and so great and like bold. This is what we want to see in a car. And I think their, um, like this alternate or this one-off special one for Miami was so, so great. Little bit of, you know, um, nods to, I think they, like Visa Cash App has a certain credit card now. So they kind of like made it look like yeah. that. And then also um just bringing in some of the Miami flair. I think it looks like Baskin Robbins, um, rainbow sherbet <laughs> ice yeah. cream. Um, but it was great. I loved it. It got better and better on the grid. I still can't just like not see Sauber because Sauber is so bright and so green. And I think I, yeah. you know, I DM Catherine that every single race. Um, but yeah, I really like B carbs. Yeah, I like you said. The, the more I saw it, the more I loved it. You know, I, I was a little bit on the fence of of how it looked, just it like statically. But watching it racing, it looked yeah. great. They even they even brought the the special livery to the F one Academy car. Um, mm-hmm. So I saw it a lot this weekend. We'll talk a little bit about F one Academy in a little bit. Um, but I like they really, from a, the standpoint of you know really nailing a special livery, V Carb knocked it out of the park. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so this is the part of the podcast that I'm very excited to talk about, which is currently someone who's on my like favorite drivers list, even though he's very non-factor, except this weekend he did, you know, kind of change the, the trajectory of the race. Um, Kevin Magnuson. I just want to spotlight yeah. him a little bit here. Um, I mean, the man worked really hard this weekend, <laughs> racking up penalties so I just want to talk about him a little bit. And I know you called him a human wrecking ball earlier. Um, but wow, what what a weekend for this man. Um, yeah. I couldn't even tell you how many penalties he accumulated because they're still reviewing shit. Uh, you know, we have to record this at some time and Miami's a later race in the day for us. So, um, And, and more, still- more importantly... I've got to watch the Dallas Stars <laughs> Vegas Golden Knights game seven, um, which is about to puck drop. So we had to do this before. And because time, time zone wise, we couldn't wait till after the race because Emily would be asleep in Argentina. Yeah. You know, working, working across time zones and cross sports, we uh, got to fit this in. But um, yeah, so he is still, still getting penalties. He also got three points on his um, super license, which is, I think he's at 18 points now. Um, eight. Oh, I thought they said 18. No, is no, it if it was 18, he'd have a race ban. The, the, the maximum you say. can get before is, is 12. Um, and so we might be in race ban territory, which we thought, you know, thought we were going to be in um, two years ago with um, Pierre Gasly, who was the human wrecking ball for, you know, 
of the great portion of his time, you know, when he was back at Alpha Towery. Um, and the question was, you know, was Formula One going to, you know, give him the penalty points? Because he got to 10. And then, you know, he, he had like three months worth of racing um, before his points were going to start to expire. Um, and, you know, were, was he going to get a race ban? And we might be in, in you know, getting close to race ban ter- territory with, you know, Kevin Magnuson. It might be a little dicey. You never know with Fernando. He's a wild that is, card, honestly. That is true. And and he he's a little upset right now with, uh, with you know, the stewards. With everyone. And Let's if, just if, say if, everyone. With, <laughs> with everyone, but specifically right now with the stewards and their alleged anti-Spanish driver bias, which might or might not be a thing. I think it might have been just a confluence of just stuff that was had been happening at the time. I don't think he deserved the penalty points that he got um, no. after the sprint in China. Um, but I don't necessarily know if it's a, like, you know, because he's Spanish thing yeah it yeah. could just be an alonzo thing honestly so it, it might be but back to kevin um back he to K-Mags. was he he was really really going up there with you know esteban Ocon and pastor maldonado of you know just getting penalties any way he could yeah i think and <laughs> one point of the broadcast they're like it's amazing he's still able to get a penalty for something he hasn't already gotten a penalty for this weekend. Right. And I died laughing because he, this poor guy, I mean, he's, and I loved his, um, his time with the media too, where he was just like, yeah, like I was driving like that and I deserve the penalties. And it's but like, that's actually what got him into trouble. I know. Because I know. I, had he not admitted it, like the, the stewards brought him in after um, the sprint race and before qualifying um, because they were investigating potential unsportsmanlike conduct, which they basically had to stop deliberating um, because the race qualifying was about to start. And, you know, it could be said that had he not been such a, you know, turd in the sprint race and admitted to being a turd afterwards, that he would have had time to actually prepare for qualifying because he did not qualify well for the race, which we saw. saw. And then he, you know, he was being an obstructionist from the back fighting with Logan Sargent. Like, is that really who he's meant to be fighting? No, no. Yeah. He ruined uh, Sargent's home race for him. Yeah. Which I mean, (laughs) Oops, sorry, Logan. Yeah. But he was also just really kind of nowhere after, you know, he obviously he finished P10 in the sprint and that was great. And I really don't know how it happened because there were so many other things that we were paying attention to in the sprint race. Yeah. Um, and and he was advanced to P10 because Lewis Hamilton got a penalty. Of course. Um, but again, this goes, this kind of goes back to our argument of the sprint format. Like, if you didn't have two big things to focus on on Saturday and instead you just had one, like, I think that would help a lot of drivers. Cause we watched a lot of drivers do well in this sprint race and then just like not do as good in qualifying because I think there's just too much going on in such a short period of time. I don't disagree. And and my question, and this this is a question that I don't have an answer to, and and you, you don't have to have an answer to is, how do we fix the weekend format then? That is, and again, that's the million dollar question. And it, I, exactly. I honestly don't want it fixed because I want to just sit here and bitch about it more. I mean, if we, I mean, yes. if we come up with a solution that ruins our fun, Catherine, we're not. I know that that's true. Here. But but the the real the, that 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 is the question. Like, it, you know, where do you put qualifying? Because you have to have a like. No, of course you have Can to have a practice session. Sense? Do we need a sprint? Yes. We do? Yeah. We need maybe. Them? I mean, they, they, Stefano Domenicali says that we do. So clearly he knows more than we do. Um, but the, you know, the, and then the, the other question is, is, is what, if we don't have a sprint, what do you do it to FP2 or FP3 instead? Nothing. Because here's another, the thing. I would question. much, <laughs> I, would, I would much rather have, like in a sitting up, like, do you remember towards the end of last season qualifying every single weekend was insane and we were like on the yeah. edge of our seat? Like, I would much rather have FP1, FP2, FP3 and it qualifying like that in a really competitive race than have like what kind of seems like half assing everything 
until the race. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. Like, was this weekend entertaining? Yes. But do I think it could have been better? Yes. Do I think the qual- last qualifying session where we w- should have been on the edge of our seat was an extreme? Oh, my God. Count? Yes. Yes. So. Yeah. It, it it was not great. And I the, the, the answer is, is that we don't right now have the answers. And we are going to no. continue to bitch about the sprint format. Fortunately, we have a few more aces of, of um, relief of, of not having to deal with or think about the sprint race format. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll have a regular race weekend coming up in Imola. And we'll be back in Imola, which we were not at last year because of the flood. So it'll be nice right. to, to actually see that that race happen and be able to you know feature it. And before we... we move on. I just want to point out that, you know, also not really talked about because very overlooked by, by Lando's win. Um, <laughs> Esteban Ocon put Alpine on the board. Honestly, I'm mad. <laughs> I'm upset. <laughs> they did bring upgrades this weekend. Um, I guess you can say they worked because they actually got a point. Um, but I'm kind of mad that Alpine is not at the bottom of the grid anymore. I miss their yeah. overweight car. I know that that was that was kind of funny. I mean, obviously the drivers didn't love that and the team doesn't love it, but it was kind of entertaining just to see how bad they could get. Um, but it also could have gone really badly because they were basically fighting each other at the beginning of the race and almost knocked each other. Oh my god, I I would have died if we had a double Alpine d- DNF again. Yeah, I that, say that again because they they've done it to themselves multiple times. These two specific drivers. So. Yeah. Ooh, Catherine, really- I just had a brain blast. Hmm. You know what we should do our next um, from the DMs on or mm. whatever we're uh, yeah from the DMs we should fix the sprint format and just talk about it and all of our thoughts and feels that way we can put all of our thoughts and feels in one episode and then we don't have to like reference Qatar 2023 <laughs> for like the rest of eternity we can just be like go and listen to our our sprint format format bitch sesh because we can just like pull random ideas when this, that would never work and was that like aren't horrible i think that's a good idea I, I think so too that that might be our next episode more to come on that um but before we we think that far into the future we also have to talk about the f1 academy because the f1 academy yes. is back um, it is. And i i understand why they don't have as many race weekends they have seven um but it's i do feel that it is a little bit weird that you know we had their first race in saudi arabia and then they haven't done anything and you know now we're in miami and then they've got another month and a half until their next uh race in barcelona um so it's just like it it's just i love the f1 academy and i want to see more of them um which i know like patience yes and they they will continue to grow out of you know more than just seven weekends but like I want to see more now right but I do think how they have their schedule set up it's good because they get races they get a really good global reach and they get races in different places and it's also reasonable amount of time in between races because I would like Another way you can think about it is like, oh, what if we just do the first seven or the last seven races of oh, the that season, would be awful. which would be horrible, right? So like, I, I do get the schedule. Do I want it expanded? Absolutely. Um, but I understand it and, it. and I think it makes sense with like where the races are so that there's like a good mix of, of viewership and different countries uh, for them to experience. Yeah, and speaking of global viewership, they are going to get even more of that. And I'm so excited because they announced yesterday that they are going to be getting basically the Drive to Survive treatment with a full docu-series um, produced by Reese Witherspoon's um, production company, Hello Sunshine, that will be on Netflix in 2025. So I'm really excited to see, you know, even more of the behind the scenes of the F1 Academy than we're already we're get, already getting a ton, a ton of access because they have everything up on, on YouTube, on F1 TV, um, on, on Twitter. Um, but I'm really excited to see the behind the scenes and for them to be able to follow these drivers um, and for us to really get a feel of what it's like to be a woman in motorsport in 2024. Yeah. Also, I'm just really excited to see Susie in action because we're going to oh, get yes, more, a lot more of that, Susie. Please. I'm very excited. Which, okay. Also... Love Martin Brundle, but I have a bone to pick with him because on mm-hmm. the grid walk, he talked to Susie and Susie was, you know, she was like, she was there with Charlotte Tilbury. I thought Charlotte Tilbury was very well spoken. She knows what she's talking about. It's cool to see that 
her sponsorship of a car in F1 Academy is not random. Like she was talking about how her and her dad, you know, she grew up watching races with her dad and she's really into it. So that's really cool to see. Like she actually has a connection versus just like throwing a random sponsorship on a car. But Susie was standing there with her and, and Martin walked away and was like, of course, you know, that's Susie, Susie Wolf, Total Wolf's wife. <laughs> and I'm like, no, oh, no, she's not. She's like head, you know, she's the I don't know. She's just managing she director. Is, what, yeah, whatever it is. She is she is the F1 Academy, um, which just made me mad and sad for him to say that. But I think, unfortunately, when your husband's Total Wolf, you will always be Total Wolf. The wife of Total Wolf. Yeah, yeah no, it exactly. was. It was and, and to, to speak back about uh, Charlotte Tilbury, I, I really like that. Not only was is it, you know, that she's sponsoring it, but she's actually involved. Like there's been right. a ton of, you know, par- you know, marketing sponsorship partnerships that they've been doing all weekend long. She's here. She's invested in it. She gave out the trophies in, in the first race. So it wasn't like, yeah, I'm going to write you guys a check for some money so you can put my, my you know, brand on a car. She, you know, there's actual real involvement. Um, um, that's, I think it, it is really cool and really great to see just how much of this investment there has been in, um, from not just Charlotte Tilbury, but you know, Formula One itself, all the different brands, it's been really exciting to see. And even this weekend in Miami, like Kendall Jenner, who, you know, does, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, she's a Kardashian, whatever, Karjan clan, whatever, but she does right. have an interest in, in cars and motorsport. Like that's always kind of been her thing. So seeing her there for not only the Grand Prix, but really there for the F1 Academy and talking with Susie and a bunch of like the, you know, wags of Formula One drivers were all supporting F1 Academy. So it is really cool to see so much support from big people. And it's not just like a random support race. Like they do have eyes on them. They're getting a Netflix show. And we've always talked about the more eyes you have on something the more sponsorship comes in, the more money you have, the more successful you're going to be. So I think this is a huge step for them. I really, really do. Yeah, it was great. I mean, even, you know, Alpine's team principal was there to congratulate Abby Poling, who won both races this weekend and both right. polls um, this this weekend for, for her, her first, you know, race win. Obviously, the second race in Saturday, she was promoted to P1 after Dorian Pond was given a penalty for taking the checkered flag twice, which is still really awkward. Um, but this was this was her first actual race win. I thought it was really funny. Um, the, the commentators for the F1 Academy, when they were going to the podium, were like, and Abby Pulling can actually celebrate by drinking the champagne in the United States because she has turned 21 since the last time F1 Academy race. Cause these, these drivers are very young. Leah Block right. who's kind of the, um, who's one of the two American drivers. She's only 17. I don't know how old Chloe, Chloe Chambers is. Um, but she's the other American driver. She's driving for Haas. She had, she's had Haas's first podium ever yeah in which the is first really race. cool which is amazing um dorian pond she had a solid weekend um she's the mercedes driver um abby pulling really said not so fast you know dorian is is not going to be guaranteed to to win this championship she was in p2 and, and p3 um respectively for the two races but really you know abby pulling was just light speed ahead this this weekend um so it was you know it, it's nice to see a that the championship race you know has not been decided as early on as, as we may have expected after saudi arabia um, but B, we're seeing a lot more of, you know, mixing up in, in the grid itself because we've had, you know, two different podiums um, for, you know, for the most part, Bianca Bustamante, who's the McLaren driver, she podiumed on race two. Um, so it was, it was really cool to see, you know, how it, it's a little bit easier to, to move up in the points when you're in the F1 Academy, because those cars are a little bit smaller, so you can overtake a lot easier. And there was a lot of overtaking and a lot of really exciting racing between the two races. Yeah, and something that you brought up, which I I missed, n- wasn't aware of, is their qualifying process. So yes, yeah. So talk. I want to. You can explain it because you're better at explaining it. But I want to talk about this because this is so weird. Yeah, I I don't know how I feel about it. I've seen it being implemented in two races, and I I I don't love it. But the way it works is you have one qualifying session that's. 30 minutes long and basically you drive as fast as you can for 30 minutes and the fastest lap times um, in that session determines the grid for the first race and the grid for the second race is determined by your second fastest lap. So driver A 
lap, their fastest lap is they're qualifying for the first race. Their second fastest lap is qualifying for their second race. So in total, they take yeah. what, like 30 lap times and put it into race one, race two. Right. Cause it's I mean, two it's laps. To- it's- Cause it's, yeah, it's, I mean, they're not going to drive 30, 30, you know, 30, no, 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 30 no, no, sorry. I'm the track, but, a total but, of 30 yeah, 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 yes. drivers to each. Yeah. So yeah. In terms of just, you know, relating this to F1, because I feel like that's easiest. That would be like, instead of having Q1, Q2, Q3, drive for 30 minutes, try and put up two really fast lap times and hope for the best. Yeah, kind of. Which I don't think you I can think, get away with in F1 because there's, there's there'd be too much traffic. Um, but I just, I think what's hard to wrap my head around is there's, you know, they're tracking the fastest times for each driver during that session, but you don't know what those second fastest times are until afterwards, like yeah. way after the fact. And they're like, here's your grid for, for the second race. And that's what I really don't love about it um, is that like you like you, you're not going to be able to figure that out just by watching qualifying. No. And it's like, what would, what I would think would make more sense is like you have quality for the first race. The first race is grit, like final standings is your grid for the second race. Yeah. That's, I mean, obviously that's what the sprint format used to, to be in 2021 right. for formula one. Um, and it's, it's not bad. It's just from a, a fan tracking perspective it's really difficult to follow and I think that that would make things complicated for you know you know Formula One Academy fans who are like well how does how does the grid for race two get set and and nobody really understands that answer unless you're you know you've you've looked into it a lot where the like the Fairweather fan isn't probably going to do. So bottom line now that F1 Academy is being um, televised they just need better graphics. Yeah, they they would need a graphic to to show where that second fastest lap is going to be, and even the broadcasters don't really know that off the fly while while they're while they're going. Um, so it it just they they need a little bit more clarification on how they're going to present that, you know, to the audience as they're going. I mean, and, you know, it's and we've and, talked and, about this. It's growing pains. Like it's the first yeah. year of it being truly televised and I'm sure they'll work out the kinks, but that does seem weird that it's hard to tell. And no, I mean, I'm sure the teams do because they have so much data and stuff, but it's kind of hard to be like monitoring and watching. And I don't know. It also right. seems I mean, super it, stressful that you would have to put two really fast laps up in 30 minutes and not, I don't know. I mean, I guess in, when yeah. you have to do three to like make it out of the certain qualifying sessions but still it's it seems odd to me it's it's it, it is it is odd to me and I, I don't love it I don't think we're gonna see it for very long but it, it it's just it's it's something that I wanted to point out that is weird yeah no for sure yeah and then before we move on and talk about our predictions I just want to give an update on the, the standings real quick um Abby Pulling is way ahead after winning both races she's got 99 points Dorian Pond is in P2 with 65 points and then Maya Vug um who's the Ferrari driver she's in third with 51 um so the battle of the top three is currently still what we expected it to be out of those three drivers um but there's been a lot more movement in the you know the the middle part of that field and you know, beyond P3. And then from a constructor standpoint, we've got a really close battle right now, which is, I was a little worried that we weren't going to have, um, but we've got Prema racing in the lead with 124 points. Um, Roden is um, in second with 122 points. Compros racing is a little bit further behind um, with 82 points. Chloe Chambers um, with Haas, she drove, uh, drives for, for Compost, so she gave them a little bit of a boost this weekend. Um, fourth is ART Grand Prix with 46 points, and then fifth is MP Motorsport with 42, so they're kind of way in the back and have a little bit of work to do. Perfect. Awesome. Well, yeah, yeah. so like we were talking about, this is the second of seven races with the F1 Academy and they are televised this season. So you do get to watch and every race weekend that they have, we will be giving updates. Yes. And their next race weekend is going to be in Barcelona. So we will see you all again talking about F1 Academy in uh, June at some point in June. A little bit of a ways, but we will get there. And now for our Miami predictions to recap 
Um, Catherine and I make these predictions before anything happens on Wednesday night. And, you know, we just have to go with the flow with these. This weekend was really hard for us. And we kind of just like ended where we ended. Um, yeah. But to recap, sprint pole, we both picked Max and it was Max. So we each get um, a point there. Sprint podium was Max Charles Checo. Uh, neither of us got that um, nope. at all. We weren't even close. You had Max Checo Fernando. I had Max Lando Carlos. So, whoops. Um, Sprint P8 was Yuki. You had George. I had Lewis. Lewis had it for like a second, and then there were penalties and whatever. Yeah, that um, that was you. You and I, we we were we were yelling in our DMs about that, and it was you almost had it, and then Lewis had to speed in the pit lane. Which also, I feel like, and and we didn't talk about this in the sprint, but um, basically. Lewis was going on the inside line. He crashed into Fernando, who crashed into Stroll, who crashed into Lando, um, and was not penalized. And, you know, the broadcasters were kind of a little iffy on that because they were so, um, you know, trigger happy with penalties in the China sprint that it really, you know, I know that a lot of it, it's like it's lap one, it's turn one, and they kind of let a lot more things go there. But I do think that at the very least, um, it should have been um, looked at by the stewards it there was no action taken and i think it should have it should have been looked at um and i think that that prop that was one of the reasons why fernando is, is so upset um and i do think that lewis you know obviously speeding in the pit lane is an automatic penalty but i think that that was a little bit of a give back for not looking into that lap one incident yeah Okay, and then moving into the Grand Prix poll, we both picked Max. It was Max, so we each get a point there. Go team. Yep. Um, and our podiums were just blown, but I've never nope. been happier to have it be wrong. Um, I know. Lando won, Max was P2, Charles was uh, P3. You had Max Checo Carlos, I had Max Checo Carlos. So, yes. very wrong, very happy to be wrong. And then, in a surprise to everyone, Shock. Akon got P10, which like we said earlier, breaks the streak of no points for Alpine this season. I had Logan hoping he would have a good home race. Um, and then he didn't. did not finish. And then you picked Yuki, who actually ended up with more points, so I'm I'm very happy for him there. So, yeah. If you it are was, keeping track, Catherine has 18 points. I have nine. And I just want to say this can change so quickly because there was just one race where Catherine did really, really well, and now I'm behind by nine points. Um, but and you could easily get nine points in a weekend. Exactly. I will I will get there. Um, for biggest surprise, Catherine said that there was going to be low cringe, which there were no awkward intros. They did nix those. I'm kind of like upset about it, though, because that's kind of my favorite thing about Miami. I mean, I don't like it, but it is awkward to watch everybody have to, you know, suffer through it. Um, yeah. So you did pick that. I had... That sergeant would get points in his home race. Um, no. He did, like we said earlier, he did do P10 in the sprint, but you don't get points for P10 in the sprint. So that sucks. Who's going to do a dumb? You said Ferrari. They scraped by not doing a dumb. Um, I mean, I would say that their livery was a dumb, but besides that, yeah, that's fair. Clean weekend. And then I said that um, Miami's GP was just going to be cringy and awkward, and Alpine's. Uh, upgrades were actually going to be downgrades so I missed the mark on this so just a bit bit. all in all though I thought it was a very entertaining weekend I found myself like really planning things around this weekend where sometimes I'll be like oh fp2 is too early I'll just skip it fp3 like I don't really care I mean I do but I don't I watch it like while I do other things but I found myself really like scheduling around the races and the weekend, which normally I just do for qualifying in the race. So there was definitely more, it was more entertaining. Um, And just, I think it goes without saying, I'm so excited for Lando for him to get his first win. Yeah, Um, That's the highlight for me. So that's all I had. Yeah. uh, Full, full, full on. It was great. Um, I, I think that it was, it was nice to see, you know, an actual safety car strategy play out because um, right, we yeah. really haven't seen that type of, you know, 
we're here, here's our plan for if there's, you know, for hoping that there's a late race, you know, safety car. We haven't really had that in, in a while. So I thought that it was really cool that we did have, I mean, honestly, the last time that happened was probably, you know, the red flags in Australia last year, but that was just a whole other different kind of mess. So I, I really thought that it was, it was, it was cool to see that how, McLaren really nailed their strategy um, and executed it flawlessly. Well, I think they were really banking on K Mags to keep driving the way that he was all weekend. Clearly. <laughs> so I think they put a lot of eggs in the K Mags basket, if you want me to be honest. Um, but no, it is, it is, you know, always exciting to see a safety car strategy work because I feel like a lot of times we'll see a safety car strategy and it's there is no safety car and then that person yeah. is kind of screwed. So it is good to see that, um, you know, come to fruition, but yeah. All right. And we are at the end of the episode. So that means that we have Catherine's F1 fun fact. So what is your fun fact for us today? The fun fact is Lando Norris won his first formula one race in his career. Yeah. Forever. That's it. And we were talking That's about this fact. earlier too. Lando's not going to remember Anything, anything about this no tonight. he's he's gonna have a really fun night tonight um that he will remember through pictures and videos god and the bless. bandage on his nose god bless oh well that is the end of our miami recap episode up next um the next race is imola in italy which is exciting we have two weeks so we'll probably have another episode for you guys in between tbd um we'll but yeah thanks for going off track with us guys